right, I think we can get started. Um, my name is Rami Crispin. I'm going to talk today about the uh, open source and how to productionize your open source project. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm really excited to be here at first conference outside of the US, so it's a really different than so far. I'm really enjoying it. So we'll start with just a quick introduction. I'm a data science engineer and data science and engineer manager at Apple. Uh, by all means, I'm not representing today Apple here. Uh, I mainly focus on forecasting, time series forecasting, uh, MLOps. I'm open source contributor, uh, mainly to the language R. And I'm author of a book about time series. I'm currently working on two books. Uh, one is time series, the other one is about Docker for data science. And I love data. So I'm one of those weird people that on their free time uh, enjoying look at data sets, API, uh, and package them into a, a libraries. Uh, so in this example, you can see a couple of uh, my main data packages. Uh, the top two are focusing on electricity and gas consumption in the US. It's a time series. Uh, the airplane below SFO is uh, passengers, uh, travels in uh, San Francisco International Airport. And uh, during the COVID, I did a couple of uh, packages related to COVID-19 data. Um, I'm going to give a talk tomorrow about forecasting. Uh, that's another topic. So if you are here tomorrow, feel free to come, I think, at the same time. Uh, it's about uh, forecasting at scale using uh, different methods. So you're welcome to come. Today, I'm going to focus on MLOps and open source together. Um, and the agenda is very simple. We're going to talk about why you want to productionize your open source project, meaning using tools like Docker, GitHub Actions, and add some automation. And then we talk about how to do it. So I'm not sure if how many of the people here used R. My assumption uh, that uh, the majority don't. So I give a big background about what is the data package, because I feel like it's very unique to R. But the idea here is that um, you store a data as a package and it's accessible. And the main use cases, one is in education, like if you are doing some research, you're filing your paper to some journal, typically you will wrap your, if you're doing it with R, you wrap your data that people can reproduce it. Um, and then the second, which I'm typically, the reason I create all those uh, data packages, if you're building some open source project, I'm doing some project in time series, you want to provide data for your example that people can try the function to your building and for your documentation. Um, and the idea is to be very accessible and there are many data sets in R that are available as a package format. I'm not sure how much is, I didn't see it in Python or other languages, so I think it's a really niche in R. Uh, the main example in R um, that are packed in in R is the Iris, the famous Iris data set, the air passengers, um, the CO, to uh, emissions and the cars. And there is a, if you are loading R, uh, the, it's coming together with R, the data sets packages, uh, package that contain about 100 da different data sets. Uh, I'm familiar with the time series one, uh, which is my main domain, but there are other data, data sets from a other field of science. So it's a very common in R. Uh, and this is just an example before we jump in. Uh, this is how you would load uh, data in R. Uh, you start by uh, use the data function, uh, specify the package, the data sets you want to load. In this case, it's the coronavirus and the package you want to load it from. And that's it. It's in your environment. You can use it as you wish. Uh, now we can talk why I started the coronavirus uh, project um, and you know to need to go to February 2020 is where uh, the pandemic just started it was already during January uh, spreading in China I went to the CNN archive see what were the newspaper or the media headlines and you could see a lot of uh, um, 
um, reports about the COVID, uh, but it was really focusing on China. It was still not coming outside of, of uh, China. Uh, and the majority of the uh, airlines were related to sport, right? It was the uh, Super Bowl, uh, the important stuff what Jello were on the break show and uh, what was the, uh, how the anthem was performed by uh, Demi Lovato. Uh, and there also there are some, you know, the kindergarten politics, uh, who talk with who, or in this case, who is not talking with whom. Um, and I remember at that time exactly, I went with my family to Disneyland, and um, on the airplane, you start to see like people starting wear masks. And, you know, it's normal, like uh, even before people, some people wear masks. I didn't put too much attention. I remember four days after when returning, there was already the first cases in the US. Uh, it was really uh, one or two. It was in California where I lived. And uh, you start to see more people suddenly wearing masks. And that's like start to feel like a little bit Oh, maybe something is maybe what they know that uh, I don't know. Um, and then when someone in the government tell you no reason for get panic, the next thing happen is uh, you know everybody get panic. I uh, I love Will Ferrell, so if you didn't see this movie, I'll, I'll recommend Semi Pro. And this is the uh, bear scene. You can find it in YouTube. But you know <laughs> since it's eat the US, um, people really start to, you know, get panic and uh, store, buy all toilet paper that they can find. Uh, and each people, you know, drive their panic differently. Um, oops, sorry, someone, something, okay. And I thought maybe it's a data opportunity here. And I remember this is, I tweeted from uh, landing back in SFO from Disneyland. And I, you know, asked, it was the John Hopkins dashboard, the famous dashboard, it was the first one. And I asked, uh, does anybody familiar with this? Where's the data source? Is it available? It took four days to build the package. I found it the same day. Uh, and the package just provide a tidy format of the uh, cases by country, uh, taking the source, which was in a uh, very not convenient format, a wide, and convert it into tidy, long format. So it was a uh, fairly simple task to do. And it took another week and a half to push it to Crane. Crane is the uh, place that store packages, our packages, so it's, uh, it became a package, and on top of it, I created a dashboard uh, that um, provide a visual representative of the cases, um, and it's got refresh every day. So every day, uh, when John Hopkins refreshed the data, I refreshed the package, and people consume, consume, could consume it. And it was really spread fast in the R community. Um, People want data, and I, I think it was the first one that provided the, in the R community this data in a, in a nice format. But very fast, I realized that using this approach of a data package is not the best way. And this is what drove me to start to look at a different approach of how to handle the data. And now we can talk about why you want to use different tools. So as mentioned, um, I refresh every every night uh, the the data uh, manually. So I ran a script. Uh, whenever John Hopkins refreshed the repository, I refreshed the data. I didn't realize that I thought it's going to be days or weeks. I didn't realize it's going to be something crazy. Uh, I think most of us didn't realize, but um, I really fast understand it's not a scalable process to start to be become big community people using it, and what if I'm on vacation, <laughs> right? Uh, so that was a problem one. Uh, the second problem was the, the data structure. Um, John Hopkins were, university were just a broker of the data. They did amazing job of bringing the data for on the country level. So think about like you need to go and scrape the data from uh, every health organization. Um, 
and combine it together. And as you can, um, you know, understand, it's like that each country might report differently. Not all the data available in a nice format of database that you do select star and you get it clean. Uh, some countries add a nice API. Others just say you can go to a website, download a CSV file, and you know the the was was the health organization that you provide the data in a PDF, which is like seriously. Um, so that creates some a, a issue with the data, and also the, you know they started. I don't think they realized where they are going with this, and the data keep change. And I noticed the data change when I ran my script, and it failed. And worse, it's it failed silence, and then you get some issues. People saying why I'm seeing negative values, or why I get those weird numbers. Uh, so that's created some challenge um, and a lack of consistency. And then. You know the, the number of issues start to pile, and um, you know that's from there. You know that's like I I, I knew I'd, like I I need to to come with different approach. Uh, I promise that's the last Will Ferrell uh, gift. Uh, that's a the anchorman. Uh, if you didn't understand, I love Will Ferrell. <laughs> All right, um, so I sit and start to think, what can I do better? And um, I met there was some other people that contribute to this package, to join into this journey, and one of them suggested, okay, why don't we convert into some semi-API? So before, it was uh, the process that I ref run a script, refresh the data, store it in a repository, and then package it. The idea of moving to API, save this the last step, and it's just um, you know run the pipeline, save it as a CSV as a flat file, and then the API just call it and all the function that will represent as API will call the data, pull it to the users, and the user will get the most recent data. So that was the first solution. Now um, we need to take care for the second one, which is automation to create a data pipeline. Um, and to remove the, to add automation to the whole process. Uh, the third item is to add a robust unit testing, right? We want to, there was a growing amount of users and we want to make sure that the quality of the data is kept and we are not really disappointing uh, the users and give them bad data. And the last but not least, um, I decided I'm using only, uh, starting like with open source tools uh, and stick to whatever is available, open source and free tools. And I was at the beginning, uh, I had a thought about using Raspberry Pi. I'm a big fan of Raspberry Pi, taking a device, build home server, run a cron job, and push the data. Uh, and then after searching, um, I found out GitHub Action. And GitHub Action was, I believe it was released at the same time of the pandemic or a little bit before. Um, and I was like, it's, you know, that's like a perfect solution. Like you, uh, someone give you a free uh, scheduler that you can use in your data. And if you're using GitHub Action, it makes sense to use it with Docker. So let me pause for a second and explain. Yes, it was true love. Uh, explain, uh, if you're not familiar, what is GitHub Action? GitHub Action is a scheduler, meaning you can set a workflow and define when you want to run the, the work. Uh, and it's also CI CD tools. You can, it support GitHub, right? If you are using a repository, it, the idea is to support the uh, works uh, that you're doing on GitHub. So for example, if you run some, run some test on your code, whenever you're doing a push or Git, um, uh, a pull request, you can run some script that run some test and give you some status update. Um, so that's, that was like perfect right on time. Uh, and if you, using it, you want to bring your own environment and Docker was the solution. Docker provide, you know, I, I know that we are in a DevOps uh, uh, developer conference, so I'm sure you all know, but data scientists are not savvy on, on Docker, right? So it was, I knew Docker, but not use it as much. So it was also a good uh, learning curve for me. But if I need to explain what is Docker from a data science perspective, um, 
imagine that you have two environment, your local machine and some remote environment. In our case, it's GitHub Action. It could be also any cloud environment like AWS, GCP, Azure, any, any, any of those. Uh, the idea here is regardless of what language you are using, R, Python, Julia, or any other open source language, if you can pa package your code inside a container, it's seamless to shift the code inside your remote environment, assuming the remote environment support Docker, and your code will work, right? So if you test it on your um, local machine and it work, the test should pass also on the remote environment. Obviously, there are some edge cases like, you know, hardware, but for most cases, it will really work really well. Uh, also, if something fail on the remote environment, you can reproduce it on your local environment. And then it's a cycle, right? So you push a new image with a fix and um, it is easy to shift a new Docker image to the container to the remote environment. Uh, so that's in a nutshell what is a Docker. Um, and the, be, the big take out from this is for data scientists is reproducibility. Data scientists love reproducibility. When you speak with data scientists about reproducibility, you can see like the tears of joy in their eyes. Uh, and that's the foundation. So that was a big motivation for me to use here um, Docker. It also saves a, a lot of time. I don't need to explain to probably some of your uh, developers. Uh, you know, it's it's amazing too. Like my data science career, can I can divide before using Docker and after. It's a, a big fan of Docker. And so I came with this general architecture about how I want to do it. Uh, and I, you know, let's let's break it down and talk about it for a second. So um, starting with your local environment, uh, you want to start with identify what are your dependencies uh, and build image with pack all your dependency um, and run your code, test it. We use Docker Hub uh, to push this image. It could be, there are other solutions, but Docker Hub is the one that is used as similar, as similar functionality like a GitHub just for Docker to store the Docker. And that's how we are pushing it to the remote environment. And then on the remote environment, in this case, this is like a GitHub repository you can start deploy your workflows. Uh, so the work first workflow here covering the test. You want to test your code. You want to make sure that uh, anytime you are making changes, you are running some a defined set of tests. And if it fail, it's give you some email and notification. Not sure why it's keep <laughs> bumping out, but um, that's like a magic, right? So. The idea here is, um, and this is this is the the um, you can see this is the YAML file uh, that's like a 14 lines of code as, as simple as is, and the idea here is um, you, here in this case you define when you want to trigger your workflow. Uh, I want to trigger because it tests whenever I push a code or I have a PR. I'm defining the environment I want to use. You can build on the fly, not recommended. Uh, it's easier to bring your own Docker because you already test it. Um, and then you run some script. In this case, this is a unit test script that you can define what test you want to run. And it's really provide this functionality. So let's cover the test. The second one, um, workflow that um, in this case I set is um, automation for the data. Uh, so here you see the difference between the previous one that here I'm setting scheduler and I'm running a cron job. So I can define whatever I want, like in terms of time, run it every hour, in this case every eight hours, I trigger a job. Um, and again, I'm defining my environment, so I'm bringing my own image. And then I'm using, in this case, I'm using some bus script with some set of function. And what it does, it's go to the, uh, some external data source, in this case, to the John Hopkins uh, repository. I'm pulling a, a function to pull the data, test the data, um, represent the test in a visual representative, 
And once I finish this process and it's successful, I also push the dashboard uh, to GitHub pages. So that's kind of like the cycle um, in in natural. Unit test, right? Um, there are different ways to create unit tests. Uh, there are building, you know, you can you have tools. I I choose after a couple of iteration to build a user a markdown document to compile the tests and visualize them. And the idea is that if something breaks, it's easy to go and see wh where uh, what was failed uh, and uh, identify exactly the problem. And this gets just a screenshot of a, a, a function that I build that go and scan all the fields, uh, identify if there is something uh, wrong. Uh, there is, you can define what you want to check, like do I get the exact number of row I expected or the range? Uh, does the data structure is aligned to my expectation? And if um, if it's not, I would just notify it and uh, will collect some metadata uh, that enable me to go and see where what was broken. Obviously, uh, it's important to say um, that there are no free lunches over here, right? Uh, so let's talk for a second about the limitation of this approach. So starting with resources, GitHub uh, Action is a free tool. Um, and obviously, you're getting a very small uh, um, compute, like a machine. It's not really robust in terms of number of CPU and memory. So if you're planning to run some crazy deep learning model or LLM, don't, okay? It's, you will burn it. Um, so that's, that's, and it's fair enough, right? You get it for free, so I'm not complaining. I'm just saying, like, put the, uh, the limitation here. And the second one is support, right? You have a community support which is great, um, but it's not, if you get stuck and something is broken, uh, you are depending on that someone will come and help you. You don't have a, a, a robust support. Last point is the uncertainty uh, that exists around this uh, product. You're getting it for free for a couple of years. You know, recent years, there were um, some rumors that they might move it into a paid service, which is fair enough, right? Uh, but um, one day it might disappear. So the the other example is like a copilot was the beginning for free, and then they decide to charge. Uh, so I think long term, they might be, it might disappear. Um, and I would pay for it, which I, I, cause I feel like it's a great service. And as long as it's going to be reasonable price. So in summary, my main takeout from this project is uh, when you start open source project, think about it as a project, as you think about a project in your work. If you're building pipeline, treat it with the same love as you would uh, in your work. Um, it might require a little bit more work, but long term you get, you know, it saves a lot of time on debugging and other stuff. So it's worth to, Think in the way, way, same way that you are you handling uh, your project at work. Scope properly, uh, identify the right tools, uh, spend more time on the tests, uh, and make sure it's robust enough. Second point, Docker. If you not familiar or never use it, there is a steep uh, learning curve, and again, long term you get the benefits. Um, I remember when I started, always before starting, I, I knew about Docker, but it always felt like, a, you know, there is a wall that's threatening, like you don't want to, you, you feel like you, you, you know, it's, you're going to hit the wall. Um, but it's not that difficult, like it's worth, there are so many tutorials out there, uh, it's worth spending the time learning it uh, if, if you're using this type of job. Unit test, I don't need to add more. It's uh, like insurance. Uh, make sure that you are creating those. Make it visual. Uh, at the beginning, 
I'm, I'm talking about the last situation, right? But I had like during the, this process, it was a process of uh, more than two years. Uh, it started with a script and whenever something breaked, I had to go dig in inside the log that, of the action in, in the GitHub page. Uh, and it was a little bit uh, harder to identify uh, what's going on. So you can add the uh, messages, like I started to, com to add more messages about each step that it's easy to understand where something fell and what step. Uh, but then I move it to um, a visual representative, deploy it on a GitHub page. Uh, it's easy, easier to track what's going on. Last but not least, knowledge sharing. So for me, it's like, a, I feel like, like as a religious thing uh, to share this knowledge. Um, a lot of people, I use stuff that a lot of good people created. Uh, so I feel like uh, paying back, I, I think it's a, in the open source community, it's very important to share knowledge. Um, so I created a couple of tutorials. Um, I'm recently, I started to do a lot of uh, VS code with Docker. So if you're interested to learn how to Dockerize, to create a a Dockerized Python environment with VS Code and the dev containers. I have a, a long tutorial for this and I'm working something similar with R. It's almost done, but it's still like some uh, work in progress. Uh, I have example of how to deploy it Flex dashboard. It's a markdown format uh, for uh, dashboards with GitHub pages, two GitHub pages and with GitHub action and Docker. Um, yeah, so. I don't know, like, there are other great tutorials. If you go to YouTube, uh, do Docker or GitHub Action, you will find a ton of those. Um, you can get in touch if you have questions um, about Docker. Feel free to catch me out, out there. Uh, happy to you know, discuss about uh, Docker, also forecasting, uh, if you're into uh, any other topics. Uh, so that's how you can, I'm technically available in almost every social media, but mainly in LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to get in touch and I will pause here to see if there are any questions. Thank you. Yes. Yes, that's that's a painful. I uh, um, I saw a few folks that created like a, a emulator for GitHub Action that you can actually run it as it's running in GitHub Action, but it's not as robust. And I would expect that GitHub would come with something a bit more robust. Uh, over time, what I adopt is I have usually like. Um, a dev version and a prod. And on a dev version, I will might run just the specific script. I will kind of like narrow down to where I see it's failing as long as, you know, I don't need to have something before uh, to save the time. But yes, that's a very painful point with, with GitHub Action. I know other people create something, but it's when I tried, it didn't feel like as robust, but I feel the pain. Yes, I should add it to the limitation. That's a good point. Any other question? Don't be shy. Okay. No. Yeah. So the question was if I tried uh, GitHub, uh, GitLab. Yeah. So no, and the, I always want to use it. It was like a, for me, it's still like a black box. And the main reason that I didn't try it is the time that need to dedicate to learn and uh, that was always kind of like the challenge to find a time, but it's good to know that that there are other other solutions. I heard good good stuff about GitLab. Yes. 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 
So that's a uh, yeah. So the question is um, that some of those the work here is with R, uh, and the short answer is yes. But um, R had a great uh, still have, uh, have as like a great uh, ecosystem for documentation. It's called R Markdown. But now the company that created uh, it used to be Ausview called now Posit. They released recently Quarto. And if you're not familiar with Quarto, essentially it's a command line tool that replaces our Markdown. And it's not running by R. So you can run it with Python, Julia, uh, Observable J uh, JS, uh, and R. And you can create, like, there is something I saw actually last week, because I wait for, 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 for this to, and the releases like recently. You can create dashboard with Python, similar with the Flex dashboard. So hopefully if I have time, I will, uh, I, I thought about yesterday, like to the flex dashboard to create, like to update it with the Python version. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if the question is like, why I prefer R? And I, I started, uh, I, I came from statistical background. So typically if you are a stats person, you would learn R. I think today Python is the major language when I started a couple of years ago, there was a gap between what R and Python. Each one was at some different variation. I think over the time, both of them closed the gaps. Python is the is the main language today. So um, I'm doing also stuff with uh, Python, but I'm native to R. Long answer, sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, so it's a good question. I will repeat it. The first question was if I was, yeah, yeah, and you ask about uh, the modeling of the coronavirus. So I. I started because I, I thought about it as time series and typically that's what I'm I'm doing. I realized quickly that it's, not, it's something I don't want to model because it's not my domain and pandemic behave differently from like consumption of gas or other stuff that it's really nice patterns. So I didn't do it, I didn't do any modeling and you know, uh, it's like a different domain of time series, which is not my field. Uh, to the second question, I always remember about the data and, and to tuning the models and the impact. So starting with the data, junk in, junk out, you need to make sure that the data quality is, is super important, right? Um, then I think there is no one answer about how to improve your models. I typically start with something simple before going to the heavy stuff. And I want to see some improvement. So you need to think about not just inaccuracy, but also compute time and, and resource that you're spending. So I always tell people, if you see in the context of time series, someone come with a paper about how amazing is deep learning, if they're not showing a benchmark running the same thing with some linear regression and show that there is a leaf in the performance, I would be a little bit suspicious. So. It's all about the data and the features that you're building. Um, and then also the quality of the data. Modeling, I think it's just engine. Think about it as an engine. Um, some models know how to handle better than others, depending on the features. And you just need to identify what works best for your case. I hope I answered the question. Any other questions? I know in time, we're, how we're doing. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>